and welcome to the Glacially Musical Podcast and YouTube Extravaganza. I am Nick Cameron of Glacially Musical, scratching my nose, and I am joined by the man who's always ready to smoke you up, Kifi Chichinchakis. How are we doing today? See a star, dude. Oh, God. I apologize for that. Uh, okay. I don't know. How are you doing today? All right. How are you doing, sir? I am tired. I uh, should... As everyone has heard me talking about a thousand times, I'm moving. So if I sent you a picture of half of my record collection missing, because that half has already been moved into the new house. So uh, for some reason, the Roger Waters Pink Floyd collection has not made it over yet. It's going to be the last. It's going to go over in the last trip next to Nick in the seat. It probably will. Right. Uh, but because... My actual moving date is just three days away. So oh. this is officially the last Glacially Musical podcast to be recorded in the home I have lived in for the past 14 years. That's, yeah, that's heavy. That's very so heavy. Next week, you will be seeing, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Uh, it might actually be so terrible I can't film, but, or I will put a cloak over everything and make a sound booth and vocal booth and put a flashlight under my face. I'll figure something out. We'll get there. Maybe some candles. Did, you know. Did you ever make like a pillow or blanket fort when you were a child? The dining room uh, table chairs. Of course. So yeah. I might do that. We'll see how it goes. But uh, got a beer check for you this week. All right, beer check it up. Founders oh, what's this? Brewing Four Giants IPA. It is a nine point two monster, and it's in a pint. I actually bought this today because all my good beer has already been moved. So I had to buy beer. And my kid looked at me as we're at the store. She's like, really? And as I'm putting it in the fridge, my wife looks at me. Really? Yeah, really? I'm sorry. So cracking it open. While Nick is pouring, I will take the opportunity to say... Glacially musical podcast, beer, metal, and swearing, and vinyl, and other things. Oh, I forgot oh, that to is say a, that. That is a nice pour. Oh, perfectly one millimeter of foam over the rim. Have you had this before? Is this a new beer to you? or It's, it's pretty new. I had one earlier today, and I don't remember it, because I've right. been working on moving all day. So all I remember is that I hurt a lot. Right. I am not moving, but I moved my body the last two nights at shows. I am going to drink yet another uh, Fort Point Brewing KSL, KSA beer. Um, this is arguably my favorite beer in San Francisco since moving here. And I'm going to have one. I have a six-pack, and I'm going to drink this, guys. You do that. I got a backup beer, just for the record. It is a Trader mm. Joe's Bosun. That's what I drank on the last podcast, I think. Uh, it is a spectacular beer. Uh, so, yes. It really is good, yeah. I enjoyed uh, it. I will get that again. You got a vinyl check or do you want me to go first? You can go first. But I, I got a that. long one. All right. Well, then we so, like to go. You go first. A couple of things happened this past week where some pre-orders came in. And also, I did some short been out at the stores. And I finally picked up a copy of High on Fire, Divermis Mysterious. I know a lot of fans are not real big, not real big on that one, but that was honestly my first High on Fire record. And the idea of a concept record about a conjoint twin of Jesus Christ, who then becomes a quantum leap time traveler to save the world, sung by a man whom you can't even understand one word by, is awesome. Because that is exactly to me what stoner metal should be. Them trying to say this most epic thing, and you can't even understand what they're saying. So they per they nailed that one. Uh, also, I, I love Matt Pike. Pick so. up "Halo of Blood" by Children of Bodom. Rest this in peace, Alexi. Oh yeah, this one is a this one's got a cool splatter. Came in the proper. Uh, is that did they come in that uh, no, mylar no, or that's your mylar? My mylar. Always, if they don't come in it, I always stick them in it. And that is something that everyone should do. Hi, Goose. I got a cat here by the records. This is not Goose. a good place for you, buddy. The cat is here. And then, eight years in the waiting for this one. It's been that long since this genius manifesto. Wait a minute. That's not the right word. 
genius, I don't know. This genius has released a record, Steve Vai's latest, Involiate. Uh, he's not reinventing the wheel for Steve Vai music. If you like Steve Vai, you're going to love it. If you don't like Steve Vai, it sure as hell is not going to convince you. Mm. And the final record, another colored album, Black Diamond Heavies, All the Hell, Their Greatest Hits. Uh, normally, I wouldn't have bought it, but half of the record is unreleased. Uh, Easy Money, Take a Ride with Me, written by T Model Ford, God rest him. And then there are a couple of tracks with uh, original member of Black Diamond Heavies, Mark Porkchop Holder, playing guitar, the one where he sings. So the only releases of the Black Diamond Heavy. Oh, oh, I like this. Nice. A tangerine, orange. tangerine, yeah. orange. Yeah, mm. nice orange color. And I will say this, and I will check it probably on the next pod, which hopefully we'll be able to do next week. We'll see. I have the entire week off for the move. We'll be doing a lot of stuff. But we, my late father-in-law was a big music fan, and he never really switched to speak of from vinyl. And he had a pretty significant collection, even after a bit of it, quite a bit of it was stolen when he lived in Arkansas. Mm. But he still had quite a few, and there were some records that we had been looking for. We could not find them. We could not find his, his epic collection. And yesterday, after the estate sale was over, my wife texts me, get over here, get over here, I found it. And I look at my phone and there's a picture of a Peter Frampton record. And I'm like, I don't really want to go over for that. But she's like, you need to get over here. All right, all right, all right. Can I do this first? She's like, no, get over here now. I can't lift these boxes. It's three giant moving boxes full of records. I have done a precursory check on them and there is some hang on sorry goose down he's up on the stereo so i did a quick precursory check and there are some gems and there's some thrift shop material but it is definitely the collection of a man who stopped listening to new music in 1970. i mean not the worst thing i saw thriller in there though so you're wrong but i, I did see thriller but let's say, let's face it everybody had thriller at a certain point in the 80s it's like having dark side of the moon you're not special if you had that no i didn't have it though i'm glad you found it because we have had many conversations about the missing albums and and your late father-in-law and rest in peace and all that and the recent gr grief trauma y'all have been going through you know my um, wife realized why we couldn't find it he lost them and he never was willing to admit that he didn't know where they were they were no one was lost lost in his house yes not lost to antiquity correct he lost them in his house they were in the garage behind a, a wardrobe that was sold in the estate sale so this box of records, you're lucky the box of records didn't get sold in the estate sale three boxes but yes you're lucky the, these boxes of records didn't get sold in the estate sale that is how close it was to them being sold and so my wife and i realized because I asked him five, six years ago, will you lend me that Janis Joplin greatest hits you've got? He's like, I don't know. How do I know you're not going to ruin it? And I'm like, Bob. You seriously? don't. And so <laughs> I, I asked him, you know, why won't you ever lend me? And he's like, you, you might ruin it, Nick. I, I don't know. What we realized was what he meant was, Nick, I know I have it, but I don't know where it is. And so my wife jokingly said, you know, my father loved you and he loved sharing with you and with your love of vinyl. Do you really think he wouldn't have busted some of these records out and you guys could have drank beer and listened to music in the living room? And I'm like, yep, that's exactly what it is. He was too embarrassed to say that he didn't know where he had put them. But we have we are so thrilled to have them we've got some doubles and we're going to take out the ones that we already owned off the shelf and replace them with his and yeah so that's my vinyl check for the week and i will show some photo i will show i'll hold some up next week cool and yeah please we that actually should be a, maybe you know even what? a no. whole episode would yes. be a good idea we will do it we will do it a whole the episode ne the next chaser should just be like a deep dive into nick's late father-in-law's vinyl 
Let's do the that. lost Done. vinyl of blank. Oh, Sorry, God. I don't know his name. Done. All right, you're up, buddy. So I'll vinyl check. A, a lot of my pre-orders are coming in, as we discussed previously. Now on the YouTube version of this pod, we are not really talking about stuff we don't have in hand. I'm still waiting for my ghosts. Unbelievable! Oh, Impera no, is out a really? week, and I don't have, I don't have them yet. Um, but I did get this bad boy that I did pre-order. This is the most recent pre-order thing that I made, and probably my last for a while. But I have stuff coming in, so that's good. This is the Metal Blade Metal Massacre oh. vinyl for the 40th anniversary of Metal Blade. They are re-releasing a bunch of stuff, but they're re-releasing they re-release Metal Massacre, which was the first compilation ever. The first thing on the label ever. Maybe even the idea of the comp presaged the idea of the label. This has the first ever recordings of Metallica with Dave Mustaine and Ron McGovney. No, um, it's uh, Lloyd Grant. Um, Isn't it? No, it's the Mustaine version is on here. Technically. Did they change? Wasn't it, it Lloyd Grant changed originally? It I think Lloyd Grant is on the demo for No Life to Leather. Oh, okay. but he's not on the Metal Massacre version. This is from '82, so 40 years. Right. And so Lloyd Grant is on the '81 version, if I'm not okay. mistaken. Okay. The No Life to Leather, much shared No Life to Leather uh, tape. This also features Steeler, Bitch, Malice, Rat in their very first recording, Sirith Ungol's first recording, uh, Demon Flight, Pandemonium, two tracks from Malice, actually. Black and Blue's first track featuring Tommy Thayer, who uh, went to Kiss. Nick's least favorite person ever to have been in Kiss, yes. which says a lot considering how terrible certain people are. And Vinnie this, Vincent. Oh, Vinnie Vincent, speaking of Vinnie Vincent, I got a story. Hold your story. I will. This also comes with a beautiful commemorative Metal Blade 40th anniversary patch. That's and I will jacket. take out this vinyl because it's on ruby red vinyl. Ooh. And I like the colors and the ruby reds and the swirlies. While you're doing that, I'm going to Google Henry. this. I really thought that was Lloyd Grant. Blood red. It's actually really beautiful looking. Uh, nice contrast on my haunt shirt, by the way. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff in the works, a lot of stuff in the mail. Still no email from Metallica. I have a really bad feeling, Chewbacca, that you're going to get this Metallica thing before me and we're not going to be able to fulfill our... Uh -huh. Wish fulfillment. You're right. You're right. That was. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's that's uh, that's my point. We we have a future oh, yeah, plan yeah. for those who haven't listened to every episode. And please feel free to go back, listen, rate, reply. Uh, we have future plan. Nick and I have both submitted to the Lords of Metallica, who we cannot go one podcast without mentioning. And we're going to do their vinyl sub club for 2022 and listen and review to each release. But Nick has gotten an email I have not gotten, so this makes me sus. I have anyway. not gotten a second email. Mm. I have not gotten the first, though. <laughs> well, the first email said, hoping to ship in March. As we record this, it is March 20th. Yikes. Now, I know there are 31 days, and there's still 11 possible days, but eh, I'm not feeling real good about this. But uh, they changed the recording of Hit the Lights between the pressings. Interesting. So on the very first one, it was Lloyd Grant. That was the very first version of it from 1981. Okay. So. I stand corrected. But on this vinyl is the Mustaine Hit the Lights version. And Metallica, let's face it, Metallica is very controlling about what comes out and what's released. Maybe they should be more controlling about what they put out in the past. But... I think this is a very cool thing for Metal Blade. Metal Blade is a hugely important label now and then. And I am super glad to support. I am hoping to get an interview with Brian Slagle for Ghost Cult Mag very soon. Very cool. I would have preferred to have the Lloyd Grant version just because it's just such a neat little thing. And just a neat little rarity uh, we we can also talk about the very little differences between the lloyd grant version the mustaine version on the solo and kirk there's no difference <laughs> there's no almost no difference i can remember the first time the i heard the mechanics so i have somewhere no i i had i no longer own but i had night of the rivet heads which i bought for 30 dollars 
1994 in a time when I made $5 and 22 cents an hour. Mm. So that is an entire day's, that's actually more than a day's work. Cause I was working part-time. So that was a day and a half of work before taxes. And I, I that was what I bought. And I remember, it's got, oh my God, it's got the mechanics. I can finally listen to the mechanics and holy, cause I'd never heard the Megadeth version cause I didn't have the money to buy that much stuff back then. And uh, oh my God, oh. one, the song is exactly the same, except for the lyrics aren't awful and the vocal melody is not awful. Um, the, the drum beat is a little more hoofy. It's a little drum hoofier. beats better on the final version from Metallica. And I'm going to say there's that middle section that alternately comes in on Kill 'em all that is not on the early mechanics version, the middle, the middle break, the middle 16. The ba -ba -ba, well, this was the ba -ba -ba, second ba -ba. version. Ba -ba -ba. This is the second version of hit the, um, the mechanics that I had. Okay. Not the first. So yeah, I, don't know. I know there's Megadeth stands where like mechanics destroys four horsemen. It doesn't. No. It doesn't. I love Megadeth. It doesn't. The no. lyrics are juvenile and bad. And, uh, and like, uh, there's aspiring. like some scorpions. They're aspiring to be juvenile. They're not quite some there. scorpions nonsense lyrics about like how fixing a car is like tuning up a woman somehow. It's really lame and doesn't. It's not very. Does not holding up well. After Would 40 also years. point out that "Jump in the Fire" from the same demo is not about the Lord of the Dark Side, but uh, I'm not sure if it's getting with a chick or jerking the gherkin. I thought it was about getting the crabs. Is that what it's about? I have no idea. I mean, it very I love well the riff. Be. I love the riff of Jump in the Fire. We're not doing a Metallica episode. Sorry. Today, yes, correct. Let's move forward. It oh, is, I forgot to mention great. how much I spent on these. Oh, yes. For, uh, this is uh, Black Diamond Heavies with about 22. Same with Steve I, 22. Uh, Children of Bodom, I uh, spent 35. A little pricey, but you're not going to find that. I found that in a store, by the way. If you um, love Alexi, it's it's worth it. Yeah, and I don't have any. And then High on Fire was also thirty bucks. So those two were a little pricier than I like to normally go, but whatever. This this so Metal Blade, in conjunction with Metallica, was really cool that Metallica helped support Metal Blade, a label they're not on. I have no association with them anymore, and ended up not being on the label in the in the long run, except for the you know except for the comp, and. Um, Metallica and Metal Blade collaboratively put these on sale. There's also, I think, an additional bundle and other things on sale for Metal Blade. So you could have bought this from Metallica.com or MetalBlade.com. I chose to buy it from MetalBlade.com. Same variant, same thing. I would. That's probably how I would have done it. I, I did see that flowing around the other day, and I went, oh, I that's pretty sweet. I believe it was 25 plus shipping, which wasn't cheap. Uh, for some reason, the shipping was a little inflated. I was disappointed. The cheap, the shit, I checked later, much to my dismay. Of course, the shipping was cheaper with Metallica because they're Metallica and they can have a drop shipping rate that's low. But um, it, it came packaged immaculately, which I was really happy about. And um, yeah, man, I'm glad to support that label and, and get this thing. And again, just to remind listeners, the reason we name check the prices is you know listen it's a tough time in the world and like you know we're not trying to money shame anybody or anything it's a luxury to be able to buy these things even if we feel like it's part of my life and i need this stuff it's um it's just to help like this is how much a new thing costs or this is how much you know a used thing costs and i think one of the things that gets left out in a lot of vinyl reviews and vinyl discussions is the relative cost for a new or used thing so nick and i are trying to incorporate this talk into our pods and, and i i will also editorialize the price i paid on each one and you know i i've said before up to 20 bucks is no brainer that's <clears throat> when it gets to 30 dollars gets questionable depending upon the album these two albums are hard to come by period so they got a little pricier yeah. the other two are brand new got them off amazon yeah. and you know i also have a record in the mail that cost $15 shipped. Mm. I have an English package coming shortly, which is something I do in order to save a bunch of money. So, because if you buy an American, if you buy a record from Discogs from the UK, 
it costs you $20 in shipping alone. Mm -hmm. So my friend Duncan is willing to be my landing pad. I send him a link and I send him money. He buys them. And then when I get five, he mails them over. So I will have those in a couple of weeks to, to vinyl check as well. And I'm going to be silly and give the price in pounds. Although I have to say the dollar lost a bit into the pound. So we are back to a buck 50 instead of a buck and a quarter. So cost interesting more than last time. Interesting. Um, yeah, man. So yeah, fun times. Um, did you have another thing you wanted to discuss before we? No, jump into no, the I had a story, but I realized it's well, pointless. So we're just you sure? You sure it's pointless? I like your stories. All right, all right, all right. I am addicted to the Kiss Forum, as everyone probably mm. knows. I cannot stop. Part of it is car crash. Part of it is legitimate conversation, and it's not always about Kiss. It you know it weaves and, and goes around. But the Vinnie Vincent Creatures Fest. Have you heard about this? Uh, not that's barely. why it hasn't sold that's why it has not sold the 850 tickets Jesus. Uh, uh, at a the nashville airport hotel where it's being held also appearing ace fraley and also appearing peter chris oh is this that thing where peter and ace are gonna appear yeah. together maybe bruce together? Kulik is also playing trickster Ooh. oh god uh quiet riot uh vixen i mean all right i mean that's not bottom shelf stuff though it's actually not that expensive it's 175 dollars however vinnie vincent has not put on a concert in over 30 years not counting his little parties where nobody's heard anything from it except for the people that paid 500 dollars to go listen to him play and drink aldi's wine and eat salad uh google rick rockin and listen to him talk about the salad if you dare if you dare and so it's some salad he loved that salad i mean he loved it so in the conversation somebody posted vinnie vincent invasion nukem the song is nukem from his unreleased album guitars from hell the it sounded like steve Vai playing after being in being put into a methamphetamine induced coma and fronted by Tom Kiefer of Cinderella after sucking on helium and being kicked in the nuts. Yikes. If you can get to one minute of that track, kudos. Jeez. Okay. Now, the fun, the nice thing, I want to give a shout out to Rob, the YouTube channel Rob Talks Beer. I did an episode with him in the past, and it is now, he's gotten such a response that he's got so many. And my episode premiered on Friday the 18th. So, oh, Bob I didn't Talks know about beer. this. Yeah. Uh, we spent an hour talking about music, this podcast, and of course, beer. I will link that in the description because I, minor I'm league gonna, hockey. I'm going to go listen right after this. Okay. I recommend maybe. Okay. Yeah, totally. I totally recommend it. I'm definitely personable. But what are we here for today? We are continuing our series on Thin Lizzy. 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 I was going to listen to Alive and Dangerous because it's all I've got. Then Lizzie on vinyl. Mm, and I just later, have not had the time. Yeah, yeah. Later on, it's not. It's not really re relevant now. I wasn't sure. That's the, why I didn't. Bother. Yeah, it's it's later on. Um, so to recap the Lizzie journey, we did a sort of very broad strokes history of the band at the early days. Nick has read a book. I have seen the recent documentary. We talked briefly about the album Vagabonds of the Western World. We talked about the single release of Whiskey in the Jar. It was just St. Patrick's Day. Whiskey in the Jar is an everyday thing for most people. It is a Celtic folk song that Thin Lizzy did their own rockin' version of that is very At well- At the St. Lu Louis Blues St. Patrick's Day game, they played Whiskey in the Jar on the PA. By Metallica. Yeah, of course. And Metallica. Metallica released their live version of it on, on Thursday for St. Paddy's that they played in Slane Castle in Ireland on Saint, uh, at a concert before the in the before times, as we like to call them. And then we did a deep, in-depth, track-by-track discussion of the album Nightlife, which is the first album that really encapsulates the Thin Lizzy sound as we know it. They're just finding their way. They're not 100% there yet, but the building blocks are now in place. Such they, a good they established their sound. 
It's a very well written record. It's a high B tier record for sure. Um, I know we don't talk about tiers in terms of rankings, but like if we should probably and like if I think we, we do were, more than you more than you realize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, like we we don't like necessarily like I said, what we should probably be doing is at the end of these runs of bands, we should rank the tiers. We did it for Robert because Robert did it himself with the quality of the records. Oh, Ooh, but uh, Robert wasn't, Plant, it, that was not hard. No, it's not hard to do at all. <laughs> this will be a little harder. Um, but so they, they come right, they come, they tour a little bit in Europe. They come right back. And again, this is the seventies where bands make at least one record a year, if not two. And they come right back less than a year later with fight in. And, um, this is now the full fledged. They had a whole record with Scott Gorham and Brian Robertson on guitar they got that twin harmony guitar thing. The, you know, Phil is deeply into his shit at this point as a writer and a singer and a storyteller. And Downey kills it. So this is just their next step up. And um, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty good document of where they were. They go 10 full songs in 37 minutes. There's also a bonus track you may or may not have heard called Half Castle. We can talk about at the end. Um, and at this yeah. time, 37 minutes is pushing the length a little bit for most bands. Yeah, for a record. Yeah, for sure. Um, Led Zeppelin trying, would do 40. Pink Floyd would do 45. I don't. Kiss remember. was at 30. Aerosmith was in there. Was in the 30s. Yes. Yeah. Every every Kiss record was about 32 minutes, 28 to 32 minutes. Yeah. I don't. 35 recall. is the. Oh no, 35 is the longest, but that's the first one after they added Kiss in Time. What was the length of a of an eight track? Do you remember? Uh, say, say, I think forty eight. I think they could get 12, okay. 12, 12, yeah. 12. Okay. Get it. Because yeah. they, on the animals, on the animals eight track, there is a solo that is only on. Is it pigs on the wing? I think it's pigs on the wing, because there there was a bit of extra length. So Snowy White plays a solo on the Pink Floyd Animals 8-track. I would love to hear it. I'm not going to YouTube it, so don't even suggest it. But since I don't have an 8-track player or the 8-track, I'll never hear it. There you go. I could just YouTube it. You could just YouTube it. All right. Probably will. So I don't know if you have any thoughts before we run down the tracks. Um, I One of the things I noticed, uh, and I, I don't know... What I'm about to say is true. I don't know a whole lot about uh, Steve Harris and all that kind of business, but there was when people. It's going to take a long time for me to make this point, and I apologize. I think when when I think of that Thin Lizzy twin guitar sound, I think of that rolling harmony. It's, and that was something that was all over this record, but there was more than that. There was a lot of the Iron Maiden style twin guitar harmonies where it's just just a, a simpler, less hooky melody, which we, we hear a lot in the classic days of Iron Maiden. And then there was also a lot of great bass playing by Phil Linen, which makes me wonder if this was something that really inspired Steve Harris and the Iron Maiden sound. Had to. He is a huge Thin Lizzy fan and oh, loves, I mean, clearly, you know, plays a bit like Phil. Um, Phil would alternate between a pick and finger style. Obviously, Steve is almost exclusively finger style. But um, the other guy that uh, Steve tends to mention is Chris Squire of Yes, who was not a finger style player, except on rare occasions. But you know, Chris Squire of Yes, the rest in peace, inspired legions of bass players with his incredible bass style and sound. The 70s his, was the decade where bass players became members of the band rather than employees. Rather than the support guys. Right. That is a, you made a very good point. They're, this is also their first album that is a commercial success on the charts in the UK. Still not a thing in the rest of the world. I believe it's 60 on the UK. 60, which, you know, 
It's better than zero. And uh, if you hit 60 on the charts, that means you're selling records. Yeah, you're selling records. And and they had been in trouble, by the way, they're on the same record label as Black Sabbath, Vertigo. And they had been in some trouble because I think this is their fourth studio record and or, or their fifth studio record. Yeah, and yeah. like the label was waiting yeah. for them to kind of like have a huge hit record they only had a huge hit single up to this point not a huge hit record and so i think the label was starting to get a little nervous like it's not going to happen and this is you know we've mentioned this before but this is definitely the time when record labels were far more willing to wait it out believing that what they saw in you would come to pass and everyone would see it it's not like you know modern days where well, I'll hit a big or buy, and and we'll and we'll bill you. We'll bill you for the record. So, that's this is also the same time that Rush was about to explode. After Rush had done uh, three or four records, and they're about to. This is when I, I feel like at this moment there's a big changing of the guard in in rock music. You have Led Zeppelin who are now slowing down. You have Black Sabbath who are slowing down. You don't really have that many 60s bands really crushing it at this point. Eric Clapton is going full nut crazy burgers on stage. So a changing of the guard is in order. You have Kiss coming in. You have Aerosmith breaking. So you have this new crop of bands that now we look back on and love. Pink Floyd is breaking at this point in time. As well. Zeppelin is at the height. If there is a peak for Zeppelin, it is right now. So, so, House of the Holy, Physical Graffiti, Arrows is going up, 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 and there's no slowing down that train. Uh, Deep Purple is killing Oh, there was it slowing down that fourth. train. It was called In Through the Hour. It was called uh, Presence. That's later, and, like, let's not, you know, I'm that's sorry. two years later, and be nice. Um, be nice. I'm salty nice. I guess. Deep Purple at this point is on their third lineup, but still good mm -hmm. somehow. Um, so yeah, there's, this is the height of, oh, and rainbows about to break rainbow is doing things at this point. Rainbow yeah. So basically over, yeah. we're looking at an era of the changing of the guard. The, the seventies came probably five years late. You said that last episode also. So I, uh, oh. last proper episode. So I, you know, I give that to you. So yes, it's, and there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of new things happening. In the 60s and early 70s, twin guitar bands weren't really a thing. So it, it's <clears throat> technical difficulties. Thank you for sending to, Today mind. is like Murphy's Law Day at my house. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, you didn't have my day yesterday, so. I know. Including my steak not being delivered, but that's besides the point. What? Yeah, a long. Is this a cooked steak, steak or, or a steak order? No, I, 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 we order steak from Grubhub. Didn't happen. They they decided from, not to play, bring... from a place you like or a different place? oh a place I love. Oh, they no. they decided not to bring it, and so I called them, and they're like, "We'll give you a refund." I'm like, "I need my steak. I'm been working all day. I'm starving. I've had a bad." They're like, "No, here's a refund. Oh, here's a coupon code you can use to order a different steak." So I go to order a different steak, and I can't use the coupon code because it's not enough. The guy didn't tell me that there was a minimum, so I'm angry. Anyway, also my IKEA bed that I bought for my daughter broke while I was building it. So I went to Ikea to get a, to get the piece replaced. They told me on the phone, oh, yeah, they've got it. Don't worry, it's fine. I sat there for an hour, hour and a half. They, they don't have it. No. no so it's being mailed to me. Fuck and I'll Sweden. get it two days after the, <laughs> the move. The Swedish chef is mailing it to you. So this thing should have been put together yesterday. Sleep on the couch, kid. Anyway. Yes. Anyway, long story. So, yeah. So the 70, 75, it's, it's a happening time. Should I also point out that's the year I was born. Probably a coincidence, but maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. But that's all I've got for for this era, yeah. this album, and all that kind of business. Yeah. So yeah, um, you know, and recorded at the famed Olympic Studios in London, home to everybody, home to every great record you have ever loved, except a couple that were at Abbey Road or you know some other place, um, Headley Grange. So let's are, are we a road? Britannia Row. Are we ready to do the track by yes, track? I am ready. I apologize. I will. I do go on. No, we all do. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You asked if I had anything else to say, and I said yes, and I said it. One more thing. 
I have sure. never heard any of these songs before today. Okay. Um, a little su- a little surprised by at least two of them that are semi well semi well known, um, but uh, not a problem. This Here is in the still, Midwest. Thin Lizzy is not. This is right. Well, this is this is my uh, my argument, my theorem to start this series is that in America, especially, but mostly, people know the greatest hits of of this band and really don't know the albums and really don't know the deep cuts. And my hope is to foster a love and appreciation of this band much deeper than the hits. And uh, this record doesn't really have the hits that the future ones have, but coming off a very strong record with Nightlife, coming off a pretty decent record with Vagabonds, coming off that number one single or top 10 single of Whiskey in the Jar that has been burned into our brains for a variety of reasons. They come out with this, their fifth record, Fighting, in 1975. Five records in four years. And um, they start the record off with an, with an interesting cover. A little bit of a surprise to me. To start the record with a cover for such a band well-known for writing their own material. Um, granted, you can make a case that Whiskey in a Jar is a cover. Because it is a cover of a folk that, song. That's like a... Uh, that's a like reimagining... A blues- it's a blues band doing a cover kind of yeah. thing. You know, well, how yes many people, no. how many people have done stones in my Passway or dust my broom or I'm a man. I mean, everybody's done those songs and right. everybody does them a little bit differently. And they, everybody makes them their own. I'm a man has like the easiest, but most fun bass part of all time. That be, 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 be. Um, the guitar part is one note. It's one yeah. string pedal. It's like when, when people say, what songs can you play? Right. Manish Boy. Yeah. So the album begins with a cover of Bob Seger's Rosalie, which in and of itself is not a well-known song, but a song that Phil Lynott loved. Uh, the band's first American tour happened right before this album. So they got one full American tour, one of their few American tours, by the way. They did not tour America, which is why the band did not become bigger here which is one of the problems with them. Um, But they opened for Bob Seger and the Silver Ah. Bullet Band, which is why they picked this song. It was kind of a tribute to how Bob treated them and in a good way and uh, forged a friendship. I think this is also about the time that Phil meets Huey Lewis for his band Clover. And uh, I don't know if you know that story, that Phil and Huey Lewis were like best buddies to the end. I do not know that. Oh, okay. Um, it was definitely featured in the movie, maybe not in the book. Uh, Huey Lewis is pre Huey Lewis and the News Band. Clover was kind of a American Thin Lizzy, if you will. That's what they were going for. Um, and and Huey had some some confidence problems, and Phil coached him and helped him get there. And, uh, and and Huey was like, well, I can just be a backup singer and a harmonica player. And Phil was like, no, mate. You can really sing. You should. Your voice is incredible. You should be a front man of your own band. One of my father-in-law's favorites was Huey Lewis and the News. I might have found a copy of a record in that. It box. has never been hip to be square, but that is a killer album. There, I'm sorry for the next probably six months. I'm gonna, gonna be like my off. father-in-law. Yeah, it's fine. You do. I'm that. gonna throw out. Oh yeah, that record was in was in the boxes. So. It's all good. You do that as you will. So Rosalie, good cover, good song. Not sure if you have any strong feelings about it, but very good song, very good cover. I, I thought it was a great way to start it off. I didn't even know it was. I didn't even notice it was a cover. They made this song sound like Thin Lizzy, and one of the things I've always said, my perfect cover ever, is "After Forever" by Biohazard for the Nativity in Black soundtrack. Because when you listen to that song, you I, when I listen to that song, I'm going to stop saying you because I'm not going to assume what you do in the shadows. When I listen to that song, I hear both Black Sabbath and Biohazard, which is great. Like um, the Pantera cover for that album that didn't make it, uh, Planet Caravan, I don't hear Pantera. Yeah, I understand so, that. Um, and on this one, this one, I don't hear Bob Seger at all. I hear Thin Lizzy. Right. And I know Thin Lizzy fans who don't like this song or cover and think it's a throwaway track on this record and wondering why it was the first song. But at the same time, because they are wrong. I mean, I don't want to say anybody's wrong, but in the context of this whole album, 
it's very up so like the last lizzie record had a little more up tempo stuff than this record so i feel like the reason this ended up the first song is it's the most up tempo fast paced song on the record there's a lot more mid tempo they got very soulful here and they got very he's very phil is very into his storytelling here um on the second track for those who love to live beautiful song great lyrics this is one of the interestingly enough there are very few songs on the whole thin lizzie catalog that are solo compositions of someone other than phil lina and so this is an album that features a lot of contributions from the rest of the band not just guitar leads or something where he actually let them bring in a song and they used it i don't know if it was it wasn't necessarily a dry time this is not yet when phil's having major problems with substances that comes later but always brian does. brian downey the drummer and phil co-wrote this is a beautiful song um you know uh it's heavy emotionally and that's what i love about this one this whole this whole record now nightlife i i described that last week as nascent thin lizzy it was there but it wasn't quite there it was still growing this is the first record where we have thin lizzy as we know them it's but it's also far more melancholy all the way through than i think most people think of when they think of thin lizzy when when I think of Thin Lizzy, I'm going to say, mm. I, Paul, I, I did it again. Yeah, the, when I no, think it's of Thin fine. Lizzy, I think of happier drinking party time songs like The Brazer right. Back in Town right. and Jailbreak, where obviously that is a fantastical story. It's it's nothing. I don't, I'm pretty sure that Phil Lina did not uh, orchestrate a jailbreak. Pretty sure. Don't know for sure. However, if you think about the storytelling in that particular song, I'm just going to foreshadow a little bit it's not good you don't want to be here tonight well how would he know if he's orchestrating the jailbreak wouldn't he be inside it's just it doesn't work don't overthink it so i it's rock and roll i will always overthink everything to the point where i'm pedantic and people okay. will tell me i'm pedantic sorry i get it and it is a, a little uh, the oh, album myself. in general is a little downbeat compared to the last one and the next one however i think there's a lot of depth here Agreed. In terms of a very, the it's writing. a very deep record. And this this song in particular was the first time we heard those classic Thin Lizzy leads. They're all the way through. They're part of the, the so, they're part of the they're part of the verses, they're part of the flourishes, they're part of the bridges, they're part of the solos, it's, they're part of every outro has that like they're like call and response, oh, yeah. harmony, twin harmonizing, all the things you imagine the hallmarks of the Lizzie sound are now fully in place. Downey is an again, I'll say it again, a very underrated drummer, really the king of the shuffle. He's got the that full eight bar shuffle down and uh when they're not shuffling along, he's just very R&B blues. I, I don't know that we have to say anyone because I was going to say, well, Phil Lynott is underrated as well. But that's the point of this series is. Yeah. So a little too underrated for me. I think I, he's, he's I completely it. agree. And that's kind of the thing, you know, the as we've mentioned before, the Department of Mental Antiquities, the whole thing started by trying to find these lost gems. But man, you're sifting for gold when you're doing that stuff everywhere. <laughs> It's true. Um, <laughs> Suicide is the third tune. This is actually a semi well known tune because it's been covered a lot. Um, it's the longest song on here. It's a solo fill composition. And, uh, you know, there's not too much to be said about the lyrics. Suicide, it's talking about personal trials and travails. Phil has been alluding to this stuff for a long time depression, drugs, alcohol, sadness, rinse, repeat. Uh, and have other you things. ever seen? Oh God! Now I don't remember the name of the damn movie. It was uh, Jason Lee and David Schwimmer. Crap! Well, I can't remember the name of the movie now. But there's a there. Jason Lee plays a writer who's writing about his his breakup, and one of the people he he meets a younger a younger girl who plays the prosecutor in something about Pam. Talk to me about that off air. Oh my God. Anyway, um, it's about a murder in, in, in Troy, Missouri. But okay. 
off air. I can't talk about this stuff. Anyway, All right, then. she says the line, I'm really into to stories about heartbreak. And this song, and I, I have really been into very depressing stuff for a very long time. Part of it was, oh, I'm so deep and misunderstood. No, I, it just makes me feel better. It's like listening to the blues. It ain't about making you feel better. It's about making people feel bad. But these kinds of songs help me feel better on a daily basis and the emotional depth the emotional range of the vocal performance on this song phenomenal might be my favorite vocal of his i've ever heard he is incredible his voice what he's able to do with his voice is unbelievable sometimes and i know that this is you gotta like put in the context that he is not a robert plant he is not a david coverdale he is not an ozzy he is not a John Anderson of yes. He is not trying to do anybody else but himself. It's very rare and unique at this age and stage. Because even Rush, who I love, started out copying other bands. Like, really badly, actually. They're nothing against John Rutsey and their first Rush record. And even the first two Rush records. They really didn't have their own sound for a minute. And, and there's a couple of classics on that debut record. But let's call a thing what it is. Do you really want to hear about Getty Lee singing about being in the mood? I don't. No. But I, I'm just saying, like... I don't for, even for know this, if they do that the, in Canada. For this guy, politely. Very politely. May I, <laughs> please? Anyway, May I, I please think, feel? Yeah. Um, how would you feel about possibly, potentially, maybe? Anyway... I, I I really think you have to like look at this age. This is the fifth album in four years for a band, and this guy's got his own identifiable style and sound. Obviously, he's influenced by a lot of other things. Everybody else is too, but his his ability to convey a line a line he wrote full of emotion um, and make you feel what he's feeling is really unique, and I really mean that. I don't just throw that around. So I, again. This is one of the better tracks on the record. Maybe the best track on the record, actually. Also, at um, this point, he's 26. Yeah. He's been through a lot of shit, though. Yeah, but I mean, I was, I mean, at 26, I didn't know shit. And I went through, yeah. I mean, I went through some stuff, but yeah. not gonna, I'm not gonna try to go tit for tat with the dead guy. Yeah, yeah. Whom not I not. love deeply. Don't, don't miss Yeah, of course. Uh, the next track is Wild One, another good, another, a little more sunny. You know, like this whole album is really a collection of stories about just kind of scamps and ne'er do wells and, you know, hell childs and young youth gone wild and all this stuff. And Wild One is like, I feel like Wild One is a song he's singing, but it's about somebody talking to him. He's talking about himself, potentially. He's talking about his bandmates. He's talking about somebody, his mother, his girl, some society, the cops. Hey man, come back to the fold and calm down a little bit. You're out there, and and that's my take on this one. To me, it it's it kind of feels to me like he's singing about what he wants to be. He's singing okay. about himself after he's gone away and come back. Aspirational, interesting. Just, I, I'm. As most people know, I don't pay that much attention to lyric lyrics in general. It's just mm. not, not my focal point ever. It, it's rare. Um, it's rarely my focal point in music. So I go based on, I, I go based on tone and timbre, about what the message is. And, you know, he was singing along, or maybe he's singing to his future self. Go on, you wild one. Some, those were the lyrics, something along those lines. And it was him. It was, was it happier than suicide? Oh, yeah. 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 But, it's a, it's a middle, the middle of the record's a little more upbeat compared to the rest of it. But it was, uh, it was still a very wistful song, which yeah, yeah. I don't associate wistful with Thin Lizzy or Phil Lineup. And that makes me that makes me think that he is he's either forgiving himself hoping that that's who he becomes it 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 feels like a foreshadowing kind of a song a personal foreshadowing to my in myself to me okay fair enough fair enough and then the fighting the title track closes side one 
uh, a little more rocking, a little more upbeat, and a little more of the Lizzie that most people, Radio Lizzie fans know, which is the sort of triumph over adversity, we're all a gang, put your hand in the circle and go, whoa, Jablonski, and... At Jablonski you know, or a different Jablonski? Um, just Woe Jablonski from the Married with Children Jablonskis. Oh, uh, Pat um, Jablonski played hockey, played goalie for the Blues. Uh, I did not know this. As a rookie in his first game, he stopped a penalty shot. That's crazy. What's amazing is that there was a penalty shot called in 1992. Yeah, really. But, uh, I actually started watching Married with Children again recently and went, hmm. It's going to take me too long for this to get good, so I didn't. Do we just passed the 30th anniversary of the, apropos of Nothing Thin Lizzie, we just passed the 30th anniversary of the Anthrax episode on on Married with Children. In Is that four. the one where Kelly was in the video? They, they, that Kelly and one? Bud win a contest to have Anthrax party at their house. <sighs> and, Anthrax, and then there's the parents go away to Florida for like sort of a timeshare rental thing. That's going to be their second honeymoon, but they, they end up being like sold on the timeshare the whole time and they never get to do it. And even though Al is ready to do it with, with, uh, Peg anyway. And then, uh, Anthrax eats like a weird mystery pack of food. I have from, a vague they get delusionally high and they play in my world, break the house down. And it's. I don't know. It's insane. But I would love to get snowed in with Anthrax, but they might not. Probably uh, going to watch that later tonight. That episode. Yeah. yeah point, you can just it. before on Hulu. we move forward, I, we know we're not a political podcast, but I want to point this out. In 1992, 1990, this was a a television show about a single income family, two children. Al Bundy was uneducated and was a commissioned shoe salesman, and none of us ever questioned how he could pay for the house. Moving I always assume they inherited that house from a dead family member, like his mom. Oh, or, that's just well. I'm just saying, like, how else did people have homes back then? Uh, um, back then, you could have, back then a in 1993, the average price of an American home was only 135 thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Yeah. All right then. Uh, anyway, then Lizzie. Then Lizzie. Sorry, sorry. Side two of fighting. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't talk about fight. Uh, real yeah, quick. Did, did you want to fighting my way back? The, the, the big thing about this one is you're absolutely right. It is far more of the Thin Lizzy hit machine that we're going to get on the next couple records. This is it's, it's kind of like a precursor to to the boys are back in town. And very fair. It's not a bad. That's not a bad thing. If you write a song, it's good. It's not quite there. Write it again. That's it. Uh, Metallica, cha- you write a song, it's great, and you did it amazingly, amazingly. Do it well. ten more times. Do it ten more times, because why not? Iron Maiden, do it ten more times. Yeah, I've um, virtual eleven too. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, side two opens up with King's Vengeance, which is a Scott Gorham partial composition and uh, another fantastical song, also not too dour. Um, you know, middle, middle length, four minutes and change. And uh, again, pretty rocking. What I really liked about this one is now we are getting more of the Thin Lizzy metaphorical, mythological, excuse me, it's more more of the Thin Lizzy mythological stuff. You know, Whiskey in the Jar was historic, was was historically allegorical. I am not trying to rhyme polysyllabic words, but here we are. And then you have Emerald, which is telling the story of an amazing battle going for a gem, which I don't know that I would send an entire army against another army for one fucking ring, but here we are. So it was nice to nice to get into that. So it, again, it speaks to where we've got now got the full Lizzie, as it were. Everything that you know about Thin Lizzie is here even maybe if you haven't heard many of these songs. Right on. Most average fans will not have heard these deep cuts on side two at all. Uh, again, so, Suicide is, is, cuts, and I'm suicide is very well. Yes, yeah, Suicide is well covered. Rosalie was on the greatest hits and is, you know, a Seeger song. It was a single. Uh, mm-hmm. Fighting is the title track, so you know it's been played sometimes on the radio, or rock radio. Or the rest of these songs are fairly unknown but I think they're pretty killer. Uh, so King's Vengeance. So what, seven out of 10? 
Well, I mean, less than that, but um, no, I Kings mean, Ven- seven out of ten are deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, King's Vengeance, pretty good. Spirit Slips Away is a little more back down tempo, and uh, again, a solo fill composition. Another one that just seems to be full of sads, but um, you know that wistful sads you talked about earlier. And I, I like that. I like. One of the things that in back in my days as a music critic, when I would really try to delve deep into music and, and really get into something is I have noticed like many thousand before me that where you are from leaves an indelible impact on what you write. There is a band, uh, Circle of Salt from Northern Quebec. Their, their music sounds cold. There is uh, another band out of Winnipeg whose name I don't remember. You know, their the title track, what, the title of the album was, you know, the 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 penetrating cold. The and it, you could hear the cold in their music. And in those areas of North America, you and I could never rationalize the chill they have in the air all the time and how cold it gets. <clears throat> Phil is living in Dublin. His family, his nuclear family lives in England. So there's a lot of disconnect and a lot of hopefulness there that, you know, this will be a family. Because that's, I, I'm ascribing a little bit of my personal experience to Phil Lina. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it on the podcast, but I did not meet my father until I was 11 or 12 years old. And there's a lot of wistfulness about the absentee father mm. in my in my in my experience, I had a lot of that. So, and then couple that with the Irish Civil War, which, you know, there's a lot going on. And so a lot of what he sings about is going to be dour. It's then it's also going to be hopeful. You're, you're going to get basically three emotions out of this man, naturally speaking, without him trying. Mm-hmm. Hopeful, dour, and depressed. All right, then. <laughs> Jeez. Um... Sorry. No, it's a lot. Not not sorry. I understood. The next track is Silver Dollar and is a solo Brian Robertson composition. And again, Brian was integral coming into the band, taking up the second guitar fully. And Brian would go on to like Motorhead. And he's quite an accomplished songwriter by himself. He already was when he came into the band. This is a very good song. Uh, Pretty rockin'. Harmony guitar again, um, you know, not not too much else. I do find that maybe the songs that are written or co-written don't have the full-fledgedness they don't that have the Phil the songs have. Oh. They don't have the panache. And this whole record is maybe like a muted panache. And like the panache is not quite there. They were holding it back maybe after the last one when they let it fly finally. And I feel like this one is like, let's be seri- a little more serious on this one and not wild and the next one is wild but this is a pretty good song the thing about this this whole album and i'll, I'll get to this song in a minute and my confusion about one thing but this whole album never sounds like a hit fish to me whereas the previous record sounded like a lot of hit fishing like we have got to do something this felt like a lot like rush's 2112 See what I did with there with when I mentioned Rush earlier. I see what back. you did there. When Rush recorded Twenty One Twelve, the label told them, "Okay, boys, hit it out of the park, or uh, go ahead and hang them up." So what did they do? They did exactly the one thing they always wanted to do, and they came out with Twenty One Twelve, a concept side about high priests that outlawed rock and roll music. 22 minutes. All right. Okay. You Whatever. That is the song that apparently everybody had been waiting to hear because it was a major hit. And it feels like at this point in time, Thin Lizzy just went, we're just going to be us. We're, there, there was a lot of partying and, you know, all that kind of goofy early 70s rock on the previous record on Nightlife. It's not here. And that tone change when a band you typically when when bands make that tone change they're either very successful or very not successful but when you are successful doing it you have achieved something wonderful 
And that is why this record, I think, is why we know Thin Lizzy today, even if it's just the greatest hits, because they changed and became them. They were willing to be themselves in front of everyone. And for art, for any kind of art, whether it's acting, whether it's painting, whether it's music, whatever it is, being yourself is what's going to sell you more than anything else. Mm. As for this Um, song, I'm confused why anybody else in the world sings about dollars. (laughs) <laughs> well i think it's not a, a strictly lyric you know it's not a it's a metaphor let me um, have my giggle you can have your giggle um have by giggle. the way by the way silver dollar uh features ian mclaughlin from the faces who is also plays piano on rosalie plays piano here and roger chapman from family and not very well known band in america but like a hugely influential rock band in Britain also sang backing vocals on Rosalie. So once again, they get some guests in to help. Is there anybody from the faces who didn't become a major success later? Probably Ian McLaughlin. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Whoops. I don't know. Um, Members of the faces. Yeah, like three of the four guys. Three of the six guys are Rod Stewart, Ronnie Lane, and and Ronnie Wood. And Jeff Beck. Wasn't Jeff Beck in the faces? Not officially. Okay. Not, not officially. Might have played a uh, guest track. Or did, and then, or did uh, Jeff Beck just have all yeah. the faces later? And then, and then Kenny Jones, is he not like in The Who, right? Kenny Jones was the drummer of The Who. So like also pretty, fa- you know, replace Keith Moon. Here so apparently fa- the the way to making it is joining the faces. <laughs> it if was. You join the faces, you're going to oh, make it. Man. Oh, they also had Bill Wyman. They also had Andy Fairweather Lowe. Glenn Matlock was briefly in the band in the more later years. So that's Holy inter- crap. Just some interesting members. So of the Faces band. is the, like the Yardbirds of the 60s. Yeah, kind of the Yardbirds. Um, wow. Mick Hucknall sings okay, not sang with them. That one. Uh, UB40, Mick Hucknall. Mm. Uh, oh, Simply Red. I'm sorry. Not UB40, oh. Simply Red. Simply Red, uh, UB40, same band. Kind of. So, oops. Anywho, Said it. my bad. Okay. Uh, but anyway. Okay. Freedom song. Next to last track on the record, Gorham and Lionette composition. This is wow. probably. Wonder what this is about. Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty okay song. This is one that uh, doesn't really jump out at me strong, strongly, but it's solid. It's not terrible. It's just not good. Or it's not it- great. This is, I, I apologize for the pause. I'm trying to think how to phrase this. This is probably as close as they ever got to hit fishing. Um, I'm going to leave on, it at that. On this record. Yeah, on this record. I mean, that's not, not unfair. Um, it, 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 there, it, it sounds like a semi-insincere we're for the cause. I don't know. I think Phil was a very political guy. There's a lot of political things that run through Lizzie songs. And remember what a complicated time this was in the UK for Ireland, Northern right. Ireland. Right. And, and you know what? I'm, I'm also Brady. looking back at this 50 years later. Yeah, for sure. With very I'm different all... eyes. And I can only, I, I know that I'm trying to give the context. I'm trying to know the context, but I will never know the context there, you know? It's like when I was the only white, only white boy in class. Mm. That doesn't mean I know what it's like the other way around. Interesting. Um, I went to inner city schools in St. Louis for here and there. I understood. Went 14, I went to fourteen different schools before fourth grade. I'm sorry, seventh grade before seventh grade. Damn. Yeah. Um, I've had a so, lot. <laughs> right. So la- last song on the record ballad of a hard man solo gorham composition and lyrics pretty good song good way to end the album strong Very ending rocking solos harmonies fill great vocals and bass line very good song um good strong end bookend to the whole album definitely agree with everything you just said there and wanted to go back a little bit to the freedom song I actually skipped the last verse. I just remembered that I went, I'm done with this. So, okay. 
but this one I thought was a great end to this record and it was it, it's a good you know there, there's two schools of thought do you close it or do you leave them wanting more when it comes to a record I think you should always close it down and and I, I think a great you know you, you start it and then you got to finish it and I, I love this finish um, two other things of note here is that for this record, Phil produced this whole record himself. So this is the first thing he ever produced by himself with no oversight, which I think is interesting for a band still had not yet had like a major hit record, but obviously the label and or management believed in him enough to hey save the money or pay yourself double and whatever they did back then. And I would, um, I would guess that it's probably along the lines of we're going to get rid of you if it's not a hit anyway. So you do. You. Right. If I have to be in, in control of my destiny, I want to produce it my way. Right. I would. And that's what I would. I mean, you know, the best players want the ball. Yeah. And then um, ball hog or tugboat. And then. Saw that tour. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Mike Watt. Wow. Um, the Featuring thing Foo Fighters and yes. Eddie Vedder's wife's band. Which yeah. Sucked Hovercraft. Oh, his oh. ex-wife's band he has a different one i don't now. i don't i don't look okay okay you're what are you my wife now you know what she says here's the crap she says to me all the time do you know who patty griffin is dating no robert plant okay i hope they're happy can they play love gun now or immigrant song yeah anyway also last note about this record at least for me is that this is the first appearance of the iconic but not very much used thin lizzy logo it seems weird to say that it's only on this record and the next record and on every thin lizzy shirt and on their back like their light up background they always have like an illuminated thin lizzy mm -hmm. logo behind them but the logo itself because they had so many interesting graphic frank frazetta album covers they didn't really have their logo font plastered on everything so the thin lizzy logo as you know it with the interlocking thin lizzy is only on this record and the next one the artist who you may not know is jim fitzpatrick an irish artist most well known for the iconic che Guevara prints and posters you have seen on shirts and everything your whole life because he did a portrait of Che Guevara when he visited Ireland. And that image is the iconic Che Guevara image. He also did an album cover for Dark Throne, The Darkness, and I think a bunch of other things. Hi, FBI. We do not stand Che Guevara, just so you know. I mean, I kind of do, but I understand I, I that's too, upsetting sure. to people. Huh? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to throw, oh, look, I'm trying to throw them off. And right. you're like, oh, yeah, I love that guy. Stop it. Yeah. Left of Jesus. That's me. Anyway, Same. so. Anyway. Yeah, good record. On the way to something great. This is the buildup. This is why I wanted to kind of start back a few and not just jump into the one everybody knows. But I feel like this is a really good, really good view of who they were as a band right as they're breaking into something big. Um. And again, these two records do have essential songs. I think they would be, if you would really start loving this band, this is a good record to own. Um, is it as essential as some of the other things that are coming later? It's not, but it's it's uh, almost there. They're getting there. It is uh, 75, 80% there. Yeah. And the all of the, it's like when I tell a joke and it doesn't quite work, my buddy says to me, all the pieces are there. You just don't have them in the right order. And that's where this record is. It is all of the pieces are there. All of the ideas are there. They take the King's Vengeance and on their next record and make Emerald. They take half of these songs and make The Boys Are Back in Town. And we're, like I said, it's really close to exploding into multinational stardom. Still good stuff. Very good record. Not their best. It is definitely, if you've never heard, if you've only heard Jailbreak, Boys Are Back in Town, and Emerald, this is something to check out. 
and do not check out the Ace Fraley cover of Emerald. I'll mention that next week, too. Or, or, except the only good cover of Emerald I have ever heard is Mastodon. The only Mastodon song that's any good is Cut You Up with a Linoleum Knife for the Octane Hunger Forest colon movie film for theaters soundtrack. Okay. And on that note, Nick, take us home. Uh, Definitely... This this series so far has been very cool for me. This is a Keefe series, which is why I'm letting Keefe talk way more than me, which hurts my soul because I'm that e- egotistical. But I am really enjoying going through this and going through a band that I have only been a greatest hits fan of. And so far, we are... It, it's a lot like the Iron Maiden series, which might be the only series like this, where we have been on a constant ascension and frankly i am excited to see where we go next week with jailbreak and i have nothing else this week thank you very much for listening thank you very much for viewing if you have survived this long thank you i appreciate you and i have a small amount of legitimate feeling for you if you could please like subscribe review Do all the crazy business, you know, that people do on the YouTubes and the Apples and the the whatnots. But as it is, we are done. Thank you for listening. This is the Glacially Musical Podcast. It does not play in Peoria.